We begin chapter two where we're talking about science and specifically using science to identify a way of knowing what is going on around us. And in part to do this, we need to be able to be critical thinkers and specifically about the environment around us. So what do we mean by critical thinking? Critical thinking means making reasoned judgments that are logical and well thought out. It is a way of thinking in which you don't simply accept all arguments and conclusions you are exposed to, but rather have an attitude involving questioning such arguments and conclusions. It requires wanting to see what evidence is involved to support a particular argument or conclusion. People who use critical thinking are the ones who say things such as, How do you know that? Is this conclusion based on evidence or gut feelings? And are there alternative possibilities when given new pieces of information? Additionally, critical thinking can be divided into the following three core skills. Curiosity is the desire to learn more information and seek evidence as well as being open to new ideas. Skepticism involves having a healthy questioning attitude about new information that you are exposed to and not blindly believing everything everyone tells you. And finally, humility is the ability to admit that your opinions and ideas are wrong when faced with new convincing evidence that states otherwise. Many people decide to make changes in their daily lives based on anecdotes or stories from one person's experience. For example, Let's say that your aunt told you that she takes a vitamin C supplement every day. Additionally, she told you that one morning she was running late for work and forgot to take her vitamin C supplement. That afternoon, she developed a cold. She now insists that you take vitamin C every day or you will get sick, just like she did in her story. Many people hearing this story would just accept this and think, to avoid getting sick, I should take vitamin C. Although this type of logic is very common, it lacks critical thinking skills. If we examine this anecdote a little more carefully, you should be able to understand why. For starters, we don't know how the idea for vitamin C stopping illness even came from. Why did your aunt decide to take vitamin C rather than vitamin D or any other vitamin? Also, there was never any indication given that there exists a direct link between not taking vitamin C and developing a cold. At first glance, it may seem that way. However, there could be many other variables involved that have nothing to do with vitamin C. Maybe she was already developing a cold in that particular... So now you have an idea of what critical thinking is. It is a process that you go through to test someone's argument or assertion about something. In this particular case it was about vitamin C presenting colds or preventing colds. That still goes on. There is some scientific evidence that vitamin C, in fact there's some strong scientific evidence that vitamin C uh, can help with the cold in terms of duration and in types of intensity. However in the example that you just viewed uh, the grandmother just automatically assumed that the fact that she had not taken vitamin C and then later got sick, that was a direct result. That may or may not be true, but if you're going to look at this scenario critically, you need a few more things to analyze before you make a final decision. So, in Chapter 2, by the time you're done with it, you'll understand what science is and what it isn't. You will understand the terminology that you see up here on your screen in regards to observations, facts, inferences, and hypothesis. Uh, what you're seeing there is part of what we call the scientific method. You'll also learn about measurements, scientific measurements, and the uncertainty of those measurements. Now, it's important that anytime you read any sort of scientific journal, scientific article, or results 
of research in the scientific community, you need to be able to show the error of those particular measurements. Anytime we take a measurement, there is a little bit of error, what we call systematic error, which is not what you want. We'll talk more about that later. But error related to the instrument that you're using. Some instruments can measure down to millimeters, while others can only measure out to maybe feet and yards. But we'll talk a little bit about that later. And then, of course, the misunderstanding about science and society. Uh, this happens quite a bit, especially in the global climate change aspect. Uh, oftentimes, society will see a scientist uh, come out and talk about their research and just assume that it is the gospel. It is correct and uh, there, there is no error with that. Well, that's not necessarily true. And then we'll talk about questions related to the environment and the scientific method. So, the process of obtaining scientific knowledge, it is different from acquiring what, me, what might be called like everyday knowledge. And we have a table that follows this slide that will explain that. But with scientific type of material, it's been a process that has been developed over several hundred years. I'm going to talk a little bit about the scientific method here shortly, but it's, it's not only a method of looking at the world around you and drawing conclusions from what you see, hear, taste, smell, but it provides a powerful tool in acquiring this knowledge and understanding the world around you. Now, science in itself, it's a way of discovery. Science starts with observations about the natural world around it, and we boil those, down, those observations down to what, how, and why. Modern science does not deal with things that cannot be tested by observation. Some examples of, of those types of things would be uh, what is considered beautiful or issues of good versus evil. That is not the scientific method. It's not something we can prove or disprove. So as I get back to this, the scientific method itself, it's a way of knowing and as we're going through doing experiments on what we see around us, eventually the results of those experiments will lead to conclusions and in some cases actually becomes scientific law. But again, it allows us to be able to explain what is around us. So let's just take a look at this table here. And this is in your textbook, table 2.1. We're looking at knowledge in everyday life compared with knowledge in science. And so you see the different factors that we have listed here, such as goals, requirements, uh, the way that we resolve questions, how we understand things, the validity of the understandings, how we organize items, uh, how we acquire that knowledge, and how we test that knowledge out. The the second column here is in everyday life, and the third column is in science. So this particular table, we're looking at everyday life compared with knowledge in science. So let's just look at the first factor, goals. Most people, uh, their goal in everyday life is to live what we call, you know, the good life, to have a satisfying life. Now, what makes up a satisfying life is different as uh, from person to person, region to region, continent to continent. But in general terms, it's a way to lead a satisfying life. Now in science, the goal is to be able to know about things around you, to be able to predict how those things will change, and to explain why they change. So there is very concrete methods when a scientist is looking at goals to know the world around them, 
to be able to predict and to be able to explain. Now if we look down here, let's just look at understanding. I'm not going to go through each one of these. You can look at this in your textbook. But if we look at understanding, in everyday life, as we're walking through life, we acquire information, you know, moment by moment, second by second. You know, you look down at your cell phone and you have uh, the World Wide Web available to you on your cell phone. You have um, text messages that are coming in. You're constantly ingesting things around you. Uh, you interact with people and the world around you. So understanding can come very rapidly and kind of haphazardly. There's no well-defined um, criteria in our everyday life. However, in science, scientists pursue it very deliberately. They identify the criteria they're going to use as they go through trying to gain understanding of the world around us. Let's talk about acquisition. Well, we talked a little bit about acquisition of knowledge just a moment ago as I was explaining that. But let's look at quality control. As we go through our daily life, we're constantly correcting errors. Whether it's e uh, email errors, whether it's uh, errors with our everyday life in terms of reconciling a checkbook, uh, those types of things we're constantly, but informally, we don't necessarily have a well-defined process. In science, there are strict requirements for trying to eliminate every possible error, although that's not possible, but identifying what the sources of the error is and explaining that very clearly out there. So that gives you an idea in terms of looking at science as a way of knowing and discovering. So let's look at a specific example of science as a way of knowing. Whenever you're looking at the world around you, you are taking in observations. And here's an example here from your textbook. In other words, they are looking at Mono Lake. You could look at how many birds nest there, what type of food they eat, Now with those two types of questions, you can actually disprove. So for instance, let's say if we had 40,000 birds that nest at Mono Lake. That is something that can be tested by the scientific method. You could simply count the birds day by day. And you could prove or disprove that statement. What type of food they eat. So at that particular lake, you have brine shrimp, I believe is what the textbook talks about. You could actually make observations of that. Now let's get a little ridiculous here and let's say they eat cheeseburgers. Well, there's no source of cheeseburgers there. That's something you could disprove. So it's something you can actually observe and take measurements of. So when we're looking at science, we're looking about disproving and that leads to the concept of disprovability. So science deals with ideas at least in principle that can be disproved using a combination of tests and analysis. The example that I just talked about you could actually go and look and see if this is actually happening. If your tests or experiments cannot be devised then the explanation cannot be treated as science. That is the key here. If you can't think of a way to test it, to see if it's false, then you're really not dealing with science here. The example that your textbook uses, you can go through and read that section there. It's about crop circles. Well, this was back in the early 90s, and all of a sudden these mysterious crop circles started appearing, I believe, over in England, and actually here in the U.S. as well. I, I recall that back when I was in school. And they finally found uh, there was uh, several uh, theories out there that this was being caused by extraterrestrial beings, 
um, there were multiple ideas out there and someone came forward and actually showed that they had been doing this as a hoax and actually demonstrated um, that it was a hoax and so that uh, was easily disproved once they came forward that is an example okay let's get to a little bit of terminology here this is all leading up to what is the scientific method observations uh, that is something we all understand I talked about earlier something that can be done by the five senses that we have or if it's something beyond our senses we can use instruments to measure and to take observations that way one good example of that is the satellites that orbit the earth and some of those satellites have instruments on them that can actually take temperatures of the atmosphere they can construct a vertical temperature profile but what they use is in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum something that we can't see very short wavelengths we can't see taste or sense it in any of our senses but we have instruments that can actually measure that now inferences they're basically uh, we can actually look at it like this when you have observations these observations can lead to a generality and this generality is known as an inference now when these repeated observations support the generality the inferences then becomes what we call a hypothesis and eventually after much testing if the hypothesis cannot be disproved then the hypothesis could become an accepted fact or down the road a law so now we have the definitions of observations inferences and hypotheses we're going to move to something called controlling variables now it's desirable typically in an experiment to control all variables except the one being manipulated or studied and to very specifically define all variables so we know that observations are compiled we extend that to generalizations and that is a process that we call inductive reasoning I'll come back to that in just a little bit but when we're talking about controlling variables and in fact let me just give you a specific example from your textbook so this particular graph that you're looking at is two different plants one plant showing here in red versus another plant here in blue you're looking at light intensity on the x-axis and the uptake of carbon dioxide CO2 on the y-axis so this particular scientist made a, a hypothesis that plants can only take so much light before their uptake of carbon dioxide begins to flatten out and so what this particular scientist did is that she increased the amount of light exposure to a plant two different plants again one plant shown here in red and the other one in blue and as she increased the light intensity so what we started to see here is that the uptake of CO2 keep in keep in mind that plants they take in CO2 and expel oxygen so part of that uptake in CO2 is to be used in photosynthesis that takes place in plants and so what we see is the intensity of the light which increases as we go from left to right on the x-axis and the amount of CO2 taken in by the plant in other words this plant here shown in red increases up to a certain point of light intensity and then begins to flatten out so even as the amount of light exposure is increased 
the amount of CO2 uptake has flattened out now. And so this has something to do with what we call dependent variables and independent variables. In this particular case, the dependent variable was the rate of photosynthesis shown by the uptake of CO2. So the uptake of CO2 was dependent on the amount of light exposure the plant received. So the independent variable is what we changed the amount of light exposure and the dependent variable, the response variable, you can think about it in that terms that the dependent variable is the response variable. So we change the amount of light intensity which is the independent variable and the amount of CO2 uptake uh, begins to change and eventually flattens out. So the independent variable is the one that we changed, the responding variable was the uptake of CO2. So if it helps for you to think in those particular terms and when we talk about independent variable versus dependent variable, the independent variable is the one that we're going to change and the response would be the dependent variable. Now when we talk about data, we can break that down into two areas, quantitative, which has to do with numbers, and qualitative, which basically is non-numerical examples. You see on the screen here examples of quantitative versus qualitative. So when we're dealing with data, we're dealing with those two particular areas. Um, now we go to the scientific method. Recall earlier I talked about the scientific method. It's a process that we're going to use uh, to make discoveries about things around us in the environment. I have a YouTube video that I'm going to show you here in just a moment. Um, so yeah, hold on just a moment and I'll play that video for you here. So now we're to the scientific method. We've talked a lot about um, definitions and we've talked about variables, controlling variables, um, hypotheses, inferences, all of this is wrapped up into the scientific method and I've found a really neat video that does a nice job of combining all this into the explanation of the scientific method. method is about ordinary people doing ordinary things. That includes you, me, and other scientists in the world. The scientific method is just a process or steps taken to produce reliable results to answer a specific question. Maybe you think you don't use a scientific method in your life, but I can guarantee that you do. For example, imagine you wake up on a Saturday and you couldn't find your cell phone. That's an observation. Then you do a little research by thinking about the last time you had it. You suspect that it might be in the pocket of your pants from yesterday. That's a hypothesis. And when you check your pants, you're doing an experiment. But science and life don't always go as planned, and you find no cell phone in your pants pocket. So the second observation leads you to think again and recall what else you did yesterday. You remember that you put your cell phone in your backpack during school. So you decide it must be there, and you go and check. And lo, there it is. Life can continue, and you're so happy that you share the results with your best friend and explain why it took you so long to text them back. Science. These are the steps of the scientific method. And at any step, you can go back and repeat the process. Typically, after you conduct an experiment and conclude that your results aren't answering the question, you go back and try something else. And really, truly, observations and research are going on the entire time. Science is a continually ongoing process. Now let's break down each of these steps into their component parts. All that can be observed with the five senses are included in observations. You use your sense of smell, sight, taste, touch, and hearing to make your observations in science. Research is an important step in science because it may answer other questions you have and help refine your experiment before you go down a path that leads to nowhere or conduct an experiment that's already been done. 
Make sure you use reliable sources to learn background information. Scientific journals and online sources that are vetted and trusted are best. Avoid information from blogs and out-of-date textbooks, as the information might not be reliable. Once you have your research completed, you can form your hypothesis, which is a prediction of what you believe will occur. It is often seen as an if-then statement and is very specific. Here's an example. If gummy bears are placed in water for 24 hours, then they will swell to over twice their original size. It has an if and a then, and uses specific terms that make this experiment repeatable. The experiment itself is made of several parts. Most experiments collect two types of data, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative data relies on descriptions like soft, yellow, shiny, or wet. Quantitative data relies on numbers like 25 centimeters or 2.3 grams. Once you know what types of data you're going to collect, you can define the variables in your experiment. There is the independent variable, which is the thing you change, to see how it affects your dependent variable, which is the thing you measure. So in the gummy bear example, the change in the experiment is that the gummy bears are being placed in water. The dependent variable is the volume of the gummy bear, which is measured before and after it's soaked in the water. A valid experiment will have both an experimental group, where the independent variable is altered, and a control group, which can be used to compare the experimental group to the normal or unaltered version. In the gummy bear experiment, the bears placed in water are the experimental group, and the dry gummy bears are the control, because that's how gummy bears normally are. So to summarize, an experiment should have an experimental group and a control group. The experimental group will have an independent variable and a dependent variable. And the data that is measured and collected can be qualitative, quantitative, or both. Thanks for watching this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter at SciencePet. So to summarize the scientific method you see right here, the first thing that we do is to make observations. Uh, based upon what we're looking at in terms of trying to solve a problem. We develop the question that we want to ask about those observations. And then the second step, of course, is to develop a tentative answer to the question. That in itself is our hypothesis. Then we move on to design an experiment, a controlled experiment with independent and dependent variables. We collect the data we interpret the data and then based upon that interpretation we draw a conclusion from the data. So we compare the conclusion with the hypothesis and determine whether the results support or disprove the hypothesis. Now that doesn't mean we're done. So if we find that the hypothesis is basically consistent with the observations We'll continue to conduct additional experiments. And in the case, if the hypothesis is actually rejected, we would make more observations and then construct a new hypothesis. So we would start all over again. And in fact, this particular graphic in your book shows that. Right here, the formulation of the hypothesis. We test it. We test it by developing, by uh, getting some data. We test the hypothesis, and if it's found consistent with the hypothesis, we go back, get some new data, and we go through this again. However, if we disprove the hypothesis, now we have to go back and form a new hypothesis. So that in itself is the scientific method. We're going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the nature of scientific proof itself. When we are doing scientific research, we are looking to solve a problem. We oftentimes use what we call deductive and inductive reasoning. And in fact, observations themselves are compiled and extended to generalizations when we talk about inductive reasoning. So think about it like this. Induction begins with specific observations about the natural world and we move into logical generalizations or explanations and then we use these to induce general conclusions such as coming up with a hypothesis from existing theories. Now deductive reasoning on the other hand 
let's say if a conclusion follows logically from a reason or from a premise, we talked about premises earlier, the conclusion is said to be proven and the process is called deductive reasoning. So you can think about it like this, a deductive proof results from a conclusion that follows directly from the stated premise and relies on the logical process. Generally, deduction is employed when you're using theory to do specific events or principles. Inductive proofs must be logical, just as deductive proofs do, but the premises must also be true. So let me give you an example straight from your textbook for deductive reasoning. Talk about the straight line being the shortest distance between two points. If you say li the line from A to B is the shortest distance between points A and B, then we can conclude that the line from A to B is a straight line. Now, doesn't require for the premise to be true, but only that the reasoning is foolproof. And an example of that, again taken from your textbook, let's say we come up with the premise of humans are the only ones uh, that use tools. And then we say the woodpecker finch also uses tools. Well, our conclusion would be that the woodpecker is basically a human being. Obviously not true, but that is where you could get off kilter with deductive reasoning. So again, when we're looking at the difference between the two, inductive reasoning, we go from generalizations based on a number of observations. You see the example there. I've got a better example that I'm going to show you here in just a moment, a little tongue-in-cheek example that I think kind of shows the difference between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Inductive versus deductive reasoning, Alashma. As you may have heard, there is more than one way to skin a cat, uh -huh. although none of them are endorsed by PETA. In the same vein, there is more than one way to apply reason. For example, you may decide that it wouldn't be a good idea for you to skin a cat, because all living things are precious and you may be incurring the wrath of God by so callously torturing one of his creatures. Or you might just realize that you've got too much homework to do tonight. You got lucky this time. Either way, there's a cat out there somewhere sighing a huge meow of relief. When it comes to reasoning, there are two main ways to do it. By using inductive reasoning, or by using deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning, otherwise known as the top-down approach, starts with a general statement theory or hypothesis, and then works its way down to a specific conclusion by examining various pieces of evidence. For example, if you hypothesize that Dr. Seuss hates cats, and you provide examples from the cat in the hat that you feel support that hypothesis, you can deduce that Dr. Seuss does in fact hate cats. And let's not even get started on how he feels about thing one and thing two. Of course, it's a little more complicated when applied to an essay because there are many more pieces of evidence to consider, but you get the idea. Inductive reasoning, or the bottom-up approach, starts with a small observation or question and works its way to a theory by examining the related issue. It's a bit more exploratory by nature than deductive reasoning. Like, how does Dr. Seuss feel about cats? Well, he has this cat do some really dumb stuff, and he keeps getting it in trouble, and the kids get angry at him, and he looks weird. Though, so, yeah, Dr. Seuss doesn't seem like a big cat fan. So, how to apply these tools when writing an essay? If writing a deductive essay, you'll want to make your big statement right up front, and then spend the rest of the paper providing evidence that supports your statement. In your conclusion, you can restate your premise, and then remind the reader how fabulously you just proved your point. When writing an inductive essay, your intro will be a little more mysterious. You're going to start with the facts and gradually string together a conclusion, which will end your essay with a bang. You could also try using seductive reasoning, uh, but you'd better look good in the night.
So let's talk about models and theory. Uh, first of all, theory in terms of science and language. Scientific theories are basically substantiated, widely accepted explanations of the natural world. Okay, so they've been through the rigor of experimentation, and so this definition itself is quite different from the everyday use of the world. Lay people use the word theory, where scientists would use the term inference or hypothesis. So that right there is the difference between the everyday uh, type of individual versus the scientist. So there's a little confusion in terms of terminology there. So in common usage, the word theory uh, basically con conjures up uh, an image of speculation, whereas in t scientific usage, the term basically is the highest form of proof that is supported by an overwhelming body of evidence. Theories come from the work of research, but theories also lead to more points of research as well. It, it's a never-ending type process. Many students believe that a law is more highly proven theory. It is useful to discuss that laws are simple statements about regularities of nature, while theories themselves are explanations. Now, if we look at models, uh, you see uh, an example of a model from your textbook. But models differ from theories. Uh, although they may be heavily based on them, the models themselves are based upon theory. Um, in an attempt to construct a working mechanism, either a physical model or a virtual model, which represents part of nature, uh, it's typically in a simplified form because we simply can't represent every component uh, within a model itself. So models themselves can be used to manipulate variables in experimental frameworks. One example of, that I can think of right offhand has to do with numerical weather prediction. Uh, meteorologists use models to help forecast the weather. But these models are only as good as the data that's provided into the computer program itself. It's not possible to replicate every uh, part of an atmospheric component, but enough representation can be done to come up with a nice working model. But the models themselves, the uh, numerical weather prediction models themselves, are based upon theory uh, that has been derived over the years. Now, so far, we've been talking about setting up experiments but direct experimentation is not always possible. For instance, we can look at studies of historical data. While they're not directly experimental in that we can change or manipulate or control variables, uh, they do give valuable information about the natural world and its changes over time. Ecologists often make use of historical data uh, to extend their range of observations. One such example is the CO2 concentration in air bubbles trapped in ice cores, or the pollen concentrations contained in the sediment of a lake. Natural disturbances or accidents are also utilized when the disturbance results in what is in effect a natural experiment that could not or would not ever be purposely duplicated. Uh, one example here that you see is right out of your textbook. Uh, what you're looking at is a cross-section here uh, of a tree, and you've heard about tree rings. For each year of growth, there is a ring there, but we can look at this type of historical data and find that there were fires that occurred about every 100 years and actually was a part of nature that helped control the forest. And so there are those things out there. Um, another example is the disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. And that's an example of a tra uh, tragic disaster, but it has provided a lot of research, or I should say test beds for ecological research. So in itself, uh, we can use history to meet the primary method of are the requirement for scientific method because it gives us the ability to disprove a hypothesis. Now another non-traditional aspect of the scientific method involves imagination, creativity. So for instance, if you think about it, 
science itself is an intensely creative process. Scientists have been known to use creativity and the inquisitiveness often associated with children. Uh, that's one of the two of the qualities that make a very successful scientist. The fact that they are creative and then they are inquisitive. Scientists pose many questions that to the regular layperson like you or myself would seem silly or irrelevant to their uh, to us. But some things often happen by chance. Your textbook talks about how penicillin was discovered to be used in terms of healing and it was discovered quite by accident. So these types of things also uh, are used in terms of the scientific method as well. Now earlier in this video module I talked about scientific measurements and errors. I need to comment here that basically as I said earlier all measurements have error the only difference is the degree of error is what is different. Measurements themselves are meaningless unless we uh, provide an estimate of the uncertainty or area. So when I say uncertainty, I'm basically talking error here. People in general often fail to understand that a measurement implies a range of uncertainty which should be reported and in most scientific journals at least those with high repute uh, the error range is reported. In terms of dealings with uncertainty uh, in itself there are errors that are interjected into this called what we call experimental errors which result from just random fluctuation in measurements and then there are systematic errors which result in readings that are consistently inaccurate in the same manner such as those resulting from incorrectly calibrated instruments. One thing that I can think of in terms of a systematic error and a systematic error is really really bad you don't want that. Uh, a systematic error in itself let's say for instance that uh, you're measuring temperatures at a reporting station. So let's say you're reporting temperatures on the Simpson campus and you've been taking temperatures, daily temperatures, for many many years at the same location. And then 50 years into your um, measurement of temperatures you decide to change to a different location on the Simpson campus and in fact you decide to go to uh, more of a valley location at Simpson College. Well temperatures are going to be cooler because uh, cooler air is heavier, it tends to sink and begins to pool in areas of valleys and so you're taking temperatures, daily temperatures at Simpson College but you've changed the location of the measurement and so that is a systematic error uh, that, that is not a good one. Uh, experimental errors in itself uh, like I said they they fluctuate uh, from time to time in measurement but that's part of what you would report. Now I should also mention something on accuracy and precision because these terms are often used interchangeably they are not the same Accuracy refers to what we know and precision itself is to how well we measure. There are two types of error within this. There are errors of precision. In other words, the instrument is only capable of measuring to a certain precision. So if you have a ruler that measures in inches, uh, or let's say you have a ruler that measures only in feet, and you need a ruler that measures in inches, uh, that would be considered an error of precision. An error of accuracy is when the instrument itself or the observer is not accurate. Also a measurement itself could be very precise but inaccurate. Conversely a measurement may be accurate but imprecise. So scientists estimate the accuracy of a measurement by calculating the differences between repeated measurements and that's how you end up getting uh, to your error. Uh, an example of accuracy and precision I've always heard of that really seems to make sense to me. Uh, those of us that have uh, thrown darts on a dart board, 
obviously you want to get the bullseye and if you hit the bullseye you are very accurate so let's say you have um, uh, three of your throws right dead at the bullseye that would be accurate and also precise now I say precise because your three uh, arrows are actually very close together in the bullseye however you could be inaccurate but precise now think about that for a moment you could be inaccurate with your three throws in other words you don't hit the bullseye you hit somewhere else on the board but all three of your arrows are right close to each other that would be an example of precision so I hope that helps to make uh, some sense of that so now let's talk about processes of making decisions um, as your textbook describes it is similar to the scientific method in other words you come up with a statement of the issue that you're going to look at and what is to be decided you'll gather information uh, scientific information and in some cases non-scientific information related to what you're looking at and then you'll come up with a list of alternative courses of action once you've done that then you'll try to look ahead to find the positive and negative consequences of the course of action each one that you decide to choose because that does occur there are positive and negative aspects of any type of course of action you decide to pursue and then you come up with the probability that the consequences will occur you know how likely is it that some negative consequence of a course of action that you're looking at will occur and then basically you look at the entire uh, set of processes that you have in place and then choose the best course of action so very similar to the scientific method that we talked about earlier now I just want to talk briefly about some misunderstandings that society has about science one is that uh, related to scientific theory and we know that scientific theory is a grand scheme that relates and explains many observations and is supported by a great deal of evidence in everyday usage theory may not mean theory when we look at society some people will use the term theory when they're really talking about a guess or even a hypothesis you know, we talked about what a hypothesis is earlier in this predict, uh, particular module. And then sometimes they'll use theory for a prediction, notion, or a belief. So we have to be careful in terms of scientific method. We have to be careful how we use the term theory. It's often batted around incorrectly uh, in general public. Now let's just take a moment also to look at science and technology. A lot of times these two terms are used interchangeably but they're actually very distinct but they do complement each other to a certain degree when we're talking about science we're trying to solve a problem we're trying to find understanding about our natural world and when we talk about technology it's actually using the scientific knowledge that we've gained okay through experimentation through observation and that type of technology applying scientific knowledge scientific discovery is what benefits humans okay so think about it though in our daily lives we actually encounter the products of science look at your cell phone your cell phone is a product of science your high screen or your high definition television set is a product of science so we have to be careful and distinguish between the two but they are they are related let's talk about some misunderstandings about science now this is an interesting graphic that you're seeing on your screen so let me just go ahead and use the cursor here so you have some circles here the inner circle indicates scientific knowledge in other words things that have been tested and the theory has actually been shown tested and generally agreed upon 
And then right outside this inner circle of scientific knowledge is what we call frontiers of science and advancing knowledge. So this circle that I'm outlining here is not quite scientific knowledge, but is moving into that area, actually in or out. When you're looking at these particular circles, things can move in or out. We talked earlier about plate tectonics. Um, that particular theory, you know how continents move and drift based upon pressures, internal pressures from the uh, Earth's crust. Back, what was it, in the early 1900s, it was considered pseudoscience. In other words, it was considered beyond the fringe. But like I said earlier, after World War II, and we begin to discover the f uh, forces that act within the Earth's crust, it moved from fringe science into scientific knowledge. And then, of course, this circle right here is what we call fringe science, uh, ideas that are, that are beyond what the scientific community would uh, suggest as true science. And then beyond this circle is what we call beyond the fringe. Um, an example of that would be beliefs, faith, uh, although there is some argument there uh, with apologetics when we talk about faith that some of this is provable. But like I said, this is a science course. And so you see right here the areas of science. And like I said, ideas move in and out of this. You know, one example that I think of is global climate change, specifically the term global warming. Now, that's a whole area that we'll get to later in this particular course. But as you're looking at this, these circles of science here, we do have global climate change occurring. Okay, that is scientific knowledge. We actually have records of warming and cooling throughout uh, different periods. And so that is evidence of changing climate. Now, what is a disagreement or what is a point of contention between those that believe in global warming and those that do not. It's not that they don't believe in it, it's that they, they dis disagree on the cause. Is this a human-induced cause, the warming? The term for that is anthropogenic. Uh, but we'll get to that a little bit later in this course. And then let's talk a, a bit about environmental questions and the scientific method. When we're talking about environmental science, we're dealing with systems, and I believe it's in Chapter 4 we'll start talking about Earth Systems Science. But we're dealing with many components. Uh, we're dealing with a component of the atmosphere, the Earth. Uh, we're dealing with um, oceanography. We're dealing with geology. All of these systems that we'll learn about uh, at least later on in the course make up environmental science. When we talk about ecology, that is a component of environmental science. And so when you look at the approaches taken for the different sciences, um, when we look at an approach to studying environmental science, it's not a cookie cutter science. In other words, it doesn't fit exactly the scientific method. It's not like we can go through the four or five steps related to the scientific method and say this actually fits. We'll talk a little bit about that later as well. We talk about controlled experiments. You know, we, that's not always possible. In other words, think about it like this. If we're talking about, and I'm just going to stick with global warming here because it's a subject that um, is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I won't tell you which way I lean on that. I have changed through the years, but again, I, I'm going to hold off on that until the end of the course because I want you to come up with your own, um, your own theories, your own ideas, or I should say hypothesis. But if we're trying to conduct laboratory experiments, experiments on global warming, global warming or cooling occurs over centuries. So the time scale is beyond our lifetimes. And so in that respect, it's difficult. 
if not downright impossible, to conduct a laboratory experiment beyond our, our lifetime. And then field observations of processes are, are more than norm, things that we can observe. Okay, as we close up Chapter 2, just want to summarize here. Uh, we talk about science. It is one of many components to critical thinking about the natural world. We're going to look at environmental decisions. These environmental decisions not only involve what we call science, but they make up components of economics, social, and political consequences. Solutions themselves can reflect our values in terms of faith, um, how we look at things in terms of aesthetics, and our own ethical values. And then, of course, science itself is an open-ended process. You know, it's not a really tidy, close-the-box type process. Theories can be disproven later on, as we saw with plate tectonics. It's also important that we have careful observations of the world around us. Recall that when we're doing the scientific method, we look at observations which allow us to form inferences, and from these inferences we can lead to hypothesis. The way we're looking at it, it truly is a general guide to scientific thinking. Now, in terms of reaching scientific knowledge, your, chat, your book actually talks about inductive reasoning, and they specifically don't include deductive reasoning as part of that. We talked a little bit about the differences between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning, but scientific knowledge in itself involves both processes. But the way that this particular, as we're introducing this, we want to look at hypotheses that could be falsified. Okay, so that's why we're looking at inductive reasoning. When we talk about measurements, measurements are never exact. Um, they're approxima approximations. When we talk about using measurements or identifying measurements, it is critical that we include in those measurements the uncertainty of the error itself. In other words, plus or minus a certain amount of units when we're actually looking at measurements. We talk about the difference between accuracy and precision. Accuracy itself is how we measure, how our measurement actually agrees with accepted values, and then precision itself is the degree of exactness on a measurement. So the example that I gave earlier uh, to show you about accuracy and precision is throwing darts, and I'll come back to this again because for me it's the simplest way of looking at this, um, the difference between accuracy and precision. If you're accurate, you're hitting the bullseye, okay? You can be precise and be accurate if you throw those darts, and those three darts, all three, hit the bullseye, you're accurate in your throw, and the precision, because all three are right in that bullseye. However, you can be inaccurate but still be precise. So instead of hitting the bullseye with your three darts, you hit the edge of the board, the dart board, but all three darts are right in that particular area. So it's precise throws but not accurate. And then, of course, we talk about theory. It's a general statement that we um, come up with that relates to our initial hypothesis, which was taken from observations and testing those observations and not being able to falsify it, eventually we could move it to a theory. But a theory can be disproven later on as we learn more and more about our world around us. And then, of course, critical thinking. Critical thinking is very important just simply for the fact that you're bombarded with numerous sources of information. Some of the sources of in information are credible. Others are not credible. And you have to be able to... Um, wade through that information and to be able to determine if that information is actually credible. And so we'll talk a little bit about that later. So I hope you found Chapter 2 um, helpful and beneficial for you. 
and have a good day.